Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our open lecture on the role of sensory stimulation programs for people with severe brain injury. Uh, it's presented by members of the clinical team here at the RHN. We'll have some time for some Q&A at the end, so if you do have any questions, please could you um, submit them to the Q&A button on your screen. Um, we might not have time to get to all your questions, but we will do our best. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce firstly, Alice Howard. Uh, she's an advanced specialist speech and language therapist here at the RHN. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, Anna. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, and I'd first like to introduce my um, co-panelists. We are pushing the boundaries of our abilities technology-wise by having four different presenters on one PowerPoint today. So if it's a little bit clunky, then please uh, bear with us. Um, so we've got Dr. Andrew Hanrahan, who is one of our consultants in rehabilitation medicine, who's going to be starting, up, starting it off our talk today. And then I'll be talking a little bit, and then we're going to go on to Lucy McDonough, who is a um, highly specialist occupational therapist in the team, and Laura Chapman, who is a modern matron in RHN as well. So nice mixture of MBT talking. And um, the reason we wanted to have this open lecture today is because in the past couple of years, we've wanted to develop how we're using sensory stimulation programs in the RHN. It's come out of a couple of different service development projects. Uh, I think sensory stimulation is something we've always done here at uh, the RHN for management of people with severe brain injury and, and disorders of consciousness. But I think we wanted to better define it and organize it better within the MDT. So today we're gonna to share some of our experiences from our service development projects in the last couple of years. So we're gonna start with Dr. Hanahan. Well, thank you very much, Alice, and to all my colleagues who are co-presenting with me. Um, it's a bit wet here in London, but buenas tardes to Nicholas, who has just joined from Chile, and to uh, my colleagues from Ireland and from the rest of the UK. So to, just to start the, the talk, um, assessments in severe, even profound brain injury, which is what the term we use when consciousness is, is itself affected, um, are time, person, and place specific. That just doesn't refer to the patient or the resident in front of you, but also to yourself. Make sure that you, you are the right person to do this assessment. Uh, you've chosen your environment as well as uh, the, the relational aspect between you and your uh, the person you're assessing. So whatever the conclusion of the assessment, it must be plausible. Uh, you have to come to a formulation, sometimes on a balance of probabilities, and the person you are assessing or the family in the immediate surround of severe traumatic brain injury or prolonged disorders of consciousness must believe what you're saying. It's got to be plausible. It's got to be valid. And that is an entire guideline, which is the national RCP guideline from 2020, which looks at the evidence base for assessment, assessing patients with disorders of consciousness or severe TBI. And it must be transferable across settings, which might be within the acute systems, post-acute systems, community, uh, between countries and, um, and, and, and between different uh, specialists. Um, it does not always have to be acceptable. A lot of people find it very difficult to, to manage this ambiguous loss in the person they have in front of them, a cherished a loved one who um, um, who is no longer functioning the way they did. And while they might understand the process you've gone through, it is just not possible for them to go that additional step to accept it. So you have to manage that. Assessing something, uh, talking about it, and then leaving people um, um, high and dry is, 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 not part of the, is not part of the process, really. You must be aware of confounding errors. And I'm sure we're all aware of this, but just to reiterate again, um, an insecure diagnosis. Um, I, for one, don't offhand believe that the diagnosis given to me by the acute hospitals, often in haste, sometimes by a non-specialist, and even sometimes by a specialist. Things move on, okay? There are late recoveries, late discoveries, as far as secure diagnoses go. You must be as secure as you can be. The locked-in state, or a locked-in-like state, is something that should never be missed in terms of um, um, a, severe to, a severe brain injury, and, and it really isn't a differential diagnosis for a disorder of consciousness as it is not a disorder of consciousness. But it's, it's, it's unacceptable to miss that. Vegetative-like states are also states in which people arrive in vegetative-like states, but not from sudden global catastrophic brain injury, 
but from a slow deterioration decline. So end stage Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease could result in those states. Okay, and um, always look for the congruence. Uh, trust your clinical judgment and or it's a behavioral diagnosis at the end of the day in terms of what you see in severe ABI or with PDOC, but try and achieve some congruence between the clinical features, the uh, imaging and the electrophysiology. Medical instability is something that confounds quite a bit. In disorders of consciousness, you are trying to assess a flicker of awareness sometimes through a mist or a fog of medical complications. And the rate of false positives, false negatives can be quite high. And once you've given somebody uh, a description or a diagnosis, it tends to stick. So I think we're very careful about that. The acute hospitals have one definition of medical instability and we have another. And there's, quite a, and there's quite a gap analysis that's possible there because um, we need somebody who is assessment ready and rehab ready, not necessarily just medically stable, which is a different definition whether you're in intensive care or in a respiratory ward. Inadequate arousal, all your awareness mechanisms depend totally on your arousal mechanisms. So if you do not gain arousal and sustain arousal, sometimes for longer than just a few seconds, um, awareness assessments become very difficult and difficult to pronounce on. Circadian rhythms are very important. There's an expectation that um, brain, um, sleep, dreams, bowels will all be perfectly normal after a severe brain injury. They never are. You can try and regulate circadian rhythm uh, using agents like melatonin. One of our own consultants has done some research on this over here, very powerful research, and that can be translated. Medication. Um, which confounds, unfortunately, patients with severe ABI come with these cocktails of medication, which are often necessary, but sometimes just started prophylactically. You have to interrogate the long list of medication and try and pare them down and wean them off it. So the ones you commonly see are antispasticity agents, anti-epileptic drugs, often many, opiates, analgesics, and of course, drugs for um, paroxysmal sympathetic hy uh, hypersensitivity. So, so that is, uh, you know, things like clonidine, et cetera, or even opiates. Dual causation, never forget that the, your traumatic brain injury might not have happened very neatly. It could have happened in the context of polytrauma, chest injury, cardiac tamponade, a standstill. Look for dual pathology when you're assessing your outcomes. And these are the primary reasons. You could have anoxic brain injury in somebody with traumatic brain injury. You could have uh, ischemic strokes in people who have um, post neurosurgical um, um, tumor removal surgery, et cetera and always complications. So these are the secondary sort of causations which you have to be mindful of. Rebleeds, late vasospasm, low thresholds to re-image the brain, especially in trauma and subarachnoids, uh, very rarely in, in other conditions. Non-convulsive status epilepticus, hydrocephalus, and sinking flap syndromes, or the syndrome of the trephined, where your patients are actually more aware lying down than they are um, sat up or stood in a standing frame. Invalid conclusions, what do you do with them? And these can be, you have to be wary of these things very uh, right from the beginning. And the national guideline, Annex 2B, looks at the confounding factors. So aphasia, paralysis, apraxia, poorly assessed primary neurological pathways. And then of course, there's the subjective, and we, we all get drawn into this sometimes, um, over-enthusiastic interpretation of observations. You have to avoid observer bias, inter-observer bias, and of course, um, the, the, the bias that comes from just being part of what is a very traumatic, catastrophic situation for families. Next slide, Alice. I put this diagram up here because otherwise it's all text and this is just to uh, um, um, stimulate a different part of all our brains this afternoon. Um, I just named it startles and brainstem reflexes. We often heard this, is there a visual startle? Is there an auditory startle? These things are quite essential really to targeting what sort of sensory stimulation you're going to be using, what sort of investigations you're going to be asking for, and of course, um, whether ultimately these are all reflexes uh, at the physiological level, or are they experiential behaviors? They could be both. So the basis of sensory stimulation are these set of cranial nerve nuclei, um, all of which subserve our special sensory functions like audio, vision, uh, somatosensory pathways, um, balance. And, and, and you can see that these are all tightly packed into what is 
part of our primitive brain common to um, human primates, non-human primates and reptiles. So this part of the brain is actually common to, 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 to quite a few um, um, organisms, but yet it is this part of the brain that is so busy and the visual pathways are uh, uh, sort of cranial to what you can see on the diagram, but for a visual stimulus to result in a bilateral seventh nerve action of blinking in a visual startle requires an intact pathway on both sides of the midline to be present. Okay, so whereas on the other hand, you can see in your auditory startle, the, your sensory um, afferent limb of that reflex is the cochlear nerve. And of course the efferent is your seventh nerve and the distance between the seventh and the eighth nerve is quite small. So therefore auditory startles tend to be preserved, uh, not because they are stronger, but because they have less chance of being interrupted. The visual startle on the other hand, takes in many different pathways. Next slide, Alice. Now sensory stimulation, there are two slides more and one is the basics and one is the detail. Um, I've just roughly um, um, grouped these into what you would do before, during and after sensory stimulation. You can have your own framework to do this. It would be helpful if you actually have uh, a copy of the RCP 2020 March guideline uh, open in front of you so that you can look at table 2.2 on page 49. And uh, that's entirely possible here because you can all sort of Google the, uh, the, the reference. Before, once again, I would emphasize, absolutely emphasize a detailed neurological examination, not by a clinician, but by a group of clinicians with experienced eyes, a sense of intuition even. And these must include, there are no shortcuts here. You have to assess the primary visual pathways, either bedside assessments. Um, by the time you've got to referring somebody to ophthalmology, it has to be fairly complex, or you've neglected to do your duty, or you don't have the skills. Primary auditory pathways, primary somatosensory pathways, primary motor output pathways, and spinal pathways are all absolutely important. You can use supporting investigations like uh, EEGs, evoke potentials, uh, but the role of other modalities and having these conversations with uh, team members or even families are not root, uh, um, are that, that they are not routine investigations are sometimes quite challenging. So fMRI, PET scans, uh, near infrared spectroscopy um, are not routine investigations and these form part of the guidelines and are highlighted in bold. Neurostimulant medication, apart from all the medication that might confound your low state of arousal, there are some specific medicines that you can use to stimulate the nervous system, but you have to understand the pathways. You have to understand dopamine from serotonin to um, um, GABA. So you have to uh, know exactly which one you're targeting. You have to establish behavioral baselines. There are lots of behaviors at rest that post-stimulation appear to be related to stimulation, but really may not be occurring anything more than by chance. Spontaneous behaviors are many. Um, incidental, the usual behaviors, or what we call structured or formal behaviors from assessments. And then of course, establish a neutral, personalized, but clinical environment, an open mind in, in, in the, um, on, on the part of the assessor, but also looking, if you want a pure response, try and purify your stimulus. Um, try and um, you know, uh, do away with any interfering um, stimuli. During the sensory stimulation, standardization of stimuli over time and over person and place, that's hugely important. You can overdo this, you can over egg this sometimes by being very perfectionist and trying to be perfect. But even if you're imperfect, but if you're actually valid, that, that too should matter. Personalization of stimuli is hugely important. And um, that is why we ask in our lifestyle questionnaires, um, um, what this person or that patient or, or resident would have liked in their immediate microenvironment. Avoid untimely stimulation and overstimulation. Kindness is at the root of all families and care and concern are high up there. But there are some times when you have to eliminate interference and how you handle that message with families and explain to them is so important. So visiting, calls, timetabling. A simple shower for a patient can completely wipe out any cognitive capital uh, because think of all the stimuli that occur when somebody is showered or washed. 
there's a change of environment, there's the, the natter going on with the care staff, there are visual stimuli that are moving, static, large, small, different colours, light, dark, um, sensory um, invasion by different temperatures of water, flannel, uh, soap, and, and then of course there's noise. So there's a lot of stimulation onto what I call the carbon chip computer that can freeze it and overload it, in which case your assessments become invalid for the rest of the day. Afterwards, I would think that you have to um, document and state your professional opinion. That is what we are, we are trained to do, we're paid to do, and we have to do. So stating your professional opinion, don't change the message, just change how you handle the message. Managing an inconsistency, managing uncertainty, um, looking at different perceptions, perceptual bias, emotion is hugely important. And, and these are all the skills of an assessor uh, not just in the conduct of the assessment. Next slide, Alice, which will be my last slide. Um, I reiterate again the basics. Posture and position, time, place and person. Recheck the status. It might have changed. Some inconsiderate consultant would have started some medication and not told you about it or withdrawn certain medication and, and not told you about it either. So you have to find out, you know, if, has anything changed between your baseline assessment and your actual start of your sensory stimulation. Remove the unnecessary medications, replace the necessary with something that's more friendly, correct deficiencies, okay, optimize the balance of neurotransmitters as much as possible. Overall evidence is weak and conflicting for using medication primarily as a neurostimulant, uh, hence it's actually clinically optional, not clinically obligatory. It can be a best interest question as to something you can or can't do and used as a therapeutic trial. Every trial has a start point and an end point. You know, people should not be left on melatonin or any neurostimulant for months and years uh, in the future. An ABA -A trial design is useful um, and a single agent at a time with CRS monitoring. These are just a list of the drugs I've referred to already. Selecting them must be carefully done um, in an MDT setting and ultimately, um, uh, first of all, a decision on safety and then on efficacy. Okay, these, are, these are the common agents used. In terms, of, in terms of actual physical neurostimulation, it must be done only as part of a research program. So transcranial magnetic stimulation, DBI or deep, deep brain stimulation, as is common in Parkinson's disease, for example, must only be done as part of a research program. At the moment, we are not part of a multi-center research trial on this. We are part of an fMRI uh, study at Cambridge. And of course, there are other sensory stimulation programs, which the guideline refers to, numerous coma, coma arousal programs around the world, plus also oral trials of food, etc. So I leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. And just going on from what Dr. Hanuman has been discussing there, I wanted to go a little bit into the theoretical background and the evidence base for sensory stimulation programs. And as Dr. Hanahan mentioned, there's, there's lots of different uh, protocols for arousal um, stimulation programs around the world. Um, so I'm just gonna go a little bit into that and the kind of evidence base for them. It all comes back to promoting neuroplasticity as a means for recovery after a brain injury. So what we're wanting is for the neural networks to grow and reorganize with the hope of potentially increasing someone's responses and interaction and participation over time. And we know that neuroplasticity is impacted by the environment that an individual is in and the stimulation that they are provided with. And as Dr. Hanneran also said, it's a balance where you want to be providing sufficient stimulation that they're not at risk of sensory deprivation, which would limit plasticity. But we want to be careful about the way in which the stimulation is delivered and provided. Um, there's a risk that if someone's just bombarded with indiscriminate sensory stimulation that they may habituate to it. So the brain can kind of filter out stimulation that it's received too frequently um, and stop paying attention to it and therefore wouldn't the neuroplasticity wouldn't benefit from that stimulation that's being provided so to be very careful about the way that in which sensory stimulation is organized and delivered and that's kind of the idea with these sensory stimulation programs is that you're providing a structure for the stimulation that's being provided you're setting up tasks that differentiate between different types of stimuli uh, and then you can provide that over time. And you, the hope is that that leads to increased cortical activity and promotes neuroplasticity and hopefully some recovery of abilities over time. 
it's used a lot in the severe brain injury and PDOC populations, partly because there aren't too many other therapeutic interventions out there that can be used. Also because it's very low risk, it's non-invasive, it's cheap, and it can be done by all members of the MDT, and it, also families can be included. The evidence base for sensory stimulation programs is quite mixed. Um, if you've done a lit search for yourself, you'll see that the kind of quality of evidence can be quite varied. Uh, partly that is due to often heterogeneous populations that we're studying here. You've got people with all different types of injury, uh, different secondary complications. It can be difficult, difficult to get a large sample size of people who can be compared and to develop a control trials as well. Um, there's also the issue of trying to um, set up correct inclusion and exclusion criteria for these kind of studies. And often they are based on descriptions of disorders of consciousness, which may conflict between different papers. So sometimes people might be included or excluded from studies incorrectly or without it being valid. There's also issue around the sensitivity of the outcome measures being used in these studies. So a lot of the papers for sensory stimulation programs are based on wanting to see change in GCS over time. And as we know, a GCS score isn't necessarily going to be sensitive enough to the types of changes we're seeing as someone's progressing from, in a, from a vegetative state into a minimally conscious state and beyond. Just a GCS score isn't necessarily going to be sensitive enough to show the change that we're hoping to promote and that we might see on the outside. So again, it can be difficult for the studies to show any real benefit. Also, a lot of the evidence for sensory stimulation programs is completed when people are at the mo more acute phase of their injury. And therefore the results are kind of blurred by the sense uh, this kind of spontaneous recovery that is likely to be occurring at that stage. Saying that, however, there are a decent amount of papers out there that you can find to read about the, uh, the evidence for sensory stimulation. And I've just selected a couple to kind of focus in on. Um, this first one from 2016 is a systematic review. And the authors looked at nine studies, uh, which all looked at sensory stimulation programs for people with TBI all of which used GCS as an outcome, interestingly. And they categorized the studies in terms of the level of quality of evidence from like the top level uh, gold standard randomized control studies down to kind of single case studies or case series. And as you'll see, the most common type of evidence in sensory stimulation studies was the one group non-randomized study. So they provided an intervention for a group of people, uh, but they didn't have it necessarily a control or anything to compare with. So the, the conclusions that were made on the basis of that evidence are, are therefore not quite as high quality as if there were a control or if it was randomized. But however, the, the authors of this study kind of synthesize the results and the findings of all these different studies and give some suggestions of how sensory stimulation can be set up in a way that has maximal benefit or maximal efficacy. And they found that there was strong evidence for the use of multimodal sensory stimulation within programs, um, rather than just going kind of modality by modality, but actually having combined uh, modalities might promote cortical activation and therefore um, response. They found a moderate evidence for unimodal auditory stimulation and also moderate evidence for the use of familiar voices within sensory stimulation programs. And that's something we utilize quite a lot. Uh, they found that it was actually better to have shorter periods of more complex or meaningful stimulation rather than just an ongoing, prolonged, um, and therefore quite intense stimulation that wasn't as meaningful. So, for example, if you were going to use mu music within a sensory stimulation program, it might be better to have a short period where a meaningful song was performed live or uh, a recording was played to that individual and it was had a defined start and stop rather than just a constant low level, less, atten uh, less interesting musical background that that person is kind of uh, object uh, subjected to and might cause habituation. They, and then going on to another study, this is uh, from 2014, and it looks at the most recent uh, theoretical understanding of prolonged disorders of consciousness and the implications for that in terms of setting up sensory stimulation programs. And it, I definitely recommend reading this study because it looks at how findings from the most recent fMRI studies might link into how we set up sensory stimulation. So these authors talk about getting the right balance in terms of the simplicity of stimulation that's being provided to an individual. So you want it to be simple enough that the person with a very severe brain injury 
and a limited processing and attention capacity would be able to engage with it, not making it so simple that it's meaningless uh, and not able to engage that person's attention for any meaningful amount of time. And they also found that um, using linguistically meaningful stimuli, so real words and speech and conversation, uh, was more beneficial than just providing meaningless noises or otherwise meaningless stimulation. These also, authors also talked about um, the risk of habituation and that it's important not to just repeat the same stimulation over and over again, but to provide variety. And also for varying the intensity of stimulation, so linking back to what I said about the music, rather than just having constant low level stimulation, better to have periods of intense stimulation um, spaced out with periods of rest. And um, they also talked about wanting to have like hard onset stimulation, so rather than kind of fading into or having low level stimulation all the time, having kind of um, really significant and um, noticeable changes in stimulation over time might gather that person's attention better. Uh, the authors also talk about potential islands in high, of higher level processing that are evident for some patients in PDOC. And this very closely links to the fMRI study showing covert responses to stimulation. Um, when people were given tasks and commands that they showed cortical activity indicating an awareness and response to it, but the person wasn't able to demonstrate a behavior to respond to the stimulation. And they look at this as a evidence for needing to provide um, multimodal and complex stimulation in order to engage that person's high level cortical functioning. Um, another area that, that these authors really emphasize is the emotional and biographical salience of the stimulation being provided to the individual. And the reason for that is if you're providing stimulation that is meaningful and has a biographical content to it, you're engaging more parts of the brain to, uh, to process it, and therefore you're getting kind of greater cortical activity and potential for neuroplasticity through connectivity. Um, so if you're providing someone with biographical stimuli uh, or inf information that has a kind of emotional resonance, they're gonna be using their episodic memory, their uh, personal semantic knowledge, their emotional processing and their executive functioning to process it. And therefore you're kind of lighting up more parts of the brain and hopefully grip gaining greater connectivity between those different parts of the brain. Also, they emphasize the need to make stimulation interactive rather than just passive, again, so that you're just um, hoping to activate more parts of the brain, not just the kind of sensory pathways, but also motor activation as well and executive function. And they talk about needing to use uh, naturalistic stimuli in context. So we, I think we would really agree with that, that um, again, to get more parts of the brain firing and, and to make it multimodal, it's good to provide stimulation in context. So, for example, if we wanted to look at someone's gustatory and olfactory responses, we'd maybe take them down to the kitchen and get them interacting with real foods and drinks um, because that would potentially be more meaningful. So now I'm just going to go on to talk about how we use sensory stimulation programs at the RHN. I'm going to start by talking about individualized uh, programs and then Lucy and Laura are going to talk about our controlled sensory environment programs. Um, as part of our assessment and management of people with disorders of consciousness, we often put together a individualized sensory stimulation program. This is usually done once someone's finished their formal and informal PDOC assessment. So once we've done the WIM and the CRS and maybe the SMART and we know what areas and, and stimuli and uh, modalities they are most likely to respond to we put together a set of exercises and interactions which can be completed with them regularly by different members of the MDT. Uh, the benefit of this we find is that it's a really good way of monitoring for any change or any changes in interaction or potential for communication over time. And it's kind of a simultaneous therapy and also assessment that we're able to do. Uh, and that's something we put together for most of our individuals based on the content from their the lifestyle history questionnaire, we make it all very personalized and it's a set of exercises that can be done over time and we can see if there's patterns when they're able to best engage. And this is just a list of some ideas of what we might include in our personalized individual programs. As you'll see, some of the tasks are quite multimodal, um, such as videos where you get a visual and an auditory stimulation. Some of them are very um, emotional, have a lot of emotional content, are very biographical, and a lot of them are based on uh, changing someone's environment and making it very contextual, which again links to the kind of theory that I've just talked about. Um, now, 
So Lucy and Laura are going to talk about our controlled sensory environments. And just to say this links to some of the theory around enriched rehab environments. So enriched environments mostly comes from the stroke literature. And it's about providing maximal opportunities for cognitive stimulation by setting up an environment in a specific way. And it's been shown to um, prevent cognitive decline in the chronic phases of brain injuries, including strokes. And we wanted to use it as a possible option for sustained and appropriate stimulation over time, which is a bit less labor intensive than the one to one individualized programs that we've set it up, we were setting up. And it also links to this New Zealand room concept where you can sort of set up an environment which promotes well being and interaction. Uh, so Lucy and Laura are going to talk about how we set that up at the RHM. Great, thank you, Alice. So um, obviously Alice has just kind of touched upon the enriched environment. Um, and I think this next slide, we, we're hoping to kind of cover what have we done, I guess, to implement all of the things we've just heard um, into our ward environment and therapy sessions. So I'm just gonna talk briefly a little bit about our controlled sensory environment, which we have on the ward. Um, I'm very aware that a lot of you are from acute services and may not have that luxury. Um, so I suppose we're going to try and cover the main principles um, of what that, you know, what we've done to set that up. So hopefully you can take those points away um, and that will be useful within different environments as well. Um, so the way that we've done it is we're fortunate on our ward to have two different day areas. One is a little bit more active and then we have one side which we have set up as our controlled sensory environment. Um, and the key things that we've kind of considered when setting that up, which I suppose will apply hopefully to your services as well, are the environment, optimising the patient, which Dr Hanrahan obviously kind of covered earlier on, having a range of different stimuli um, mixed in there and access to that having a team understanding and a relative understanding of the uh, the plan for that room and then having a consistent team approach so i don't know hopefully you can see these uh, photos here but the way that we've tried to set it up is that we've got a nice timetable um, and that covers a range of different uh, sort of activities that happen across the week mixed in with very important rest periods which we've covered so um we were finding that previously that room was kind of set up with maybe, you know, TV on in the day or lights and different things happening combined with therapy sessions on top. And obviously, you know, for hearing the, the talk earlier, that's obviously far too overstimulating. So we really wanted to kind of try and regulate the space. Um, and that's how we've sort of done it with a nice timetable. We also have a nice, uh, the middle slide there is actually like a relatives information board. Um, and what that does is outlines why there are sort of set rest periods and different activities happening. So for example, if a relative was to come into the ward um, in normal times, obviously not at the moment, uh, and see their relative sitting, you know, in the dark, in a quiet space, and they're thinking, why is my relative sat there doing nothing? You know, it just helps them to understand actually that's really, really important to get a nice balance of quiet time as well as um, sensory stimulation. So that board hopefully gives a bit of background to that. Um, and yeah, I think MDT involvement is one of the other key areas which we've sort of touched upon. Really, really important to get a consistent approach. So we've done quite a lot of training um, with our team and we've got all of our assistants involved. Everyone kind of is aware of how that area works, which I think is probably one of the most important points really, is making sure that everyone knows to set it up in the appropriate way. Okay, should we move to the next slide, Alice? Perfect. So again, just some more photos to give you a little bit of an idea of how we've set this up. Um, and we've tried to set the room up very uh, kind of user friendly, as it were. Um, so we've got four different boxes, as you can see, with different areas. So things to uh, smell, things to touch, listen to and things to look at. This is just kind of boxes that we've made up um, and ordered things from Amazon and just kind of gradually added to over time so that we've got a range of different things. All of them are wipeable so that if we were doing a group session, you could sort of pass them between patients and make sure that they were clean before. We then have a folder of ideas um, available for all staff and it kind of outlines kind of how to set up the room appropriately and how to kind of use those items. Um, so we hope that, as I say, that we can kind of get anyone involved and people can come in and keep that controlled sensory environment running across the day. Um, so almost as like a complementary <laughs> add-on to the therapy sessions that those patients will be having. Um, 
we also stress kind of in that guidance the importance of like observation first stimuli and then rest um, and I just wanted to add in as well that the, the activities that we tend to do um, are not just passive activities. And I think that's a really, really key point when we're talking about this patient population is often people that are lower level um, are offered much more kind of passive activities, you know, watching telly, listening to music, which is great. Those things obviously have their time and place, but we really tried to focus on making sure that people have access to really hands on things. Um, and the, the therapists or staff, whoever's helping them, help them to really get, in, get involved in those activities as much as possible. Um, we might also use patients own items, obviously, to personalise it um, and do a one to one session in that space. Or it may be a big group session, which can be really time efficient as well for, for that reason as well. So I think that's everything to cover. Unless, Laura, you had anything additional you wanted to add, you're going to go into the nursing side of it, I suppose. Yeah, no, 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 thank you, Lucy. Yeah, no, you mm -hmm. very well. Um, I'm speaking today um, as a matron for continuing care. Um, however, I was the ward manager of the brain injury service in the past, um, over the past six years when we set up this programme. So I have experience from um, both sides of the um, pathway from assessment to long term care and how we can maintain things in the longer term for people in nursing homes and for their their future care needs. Um, so from a nursing perspective, um, Alice, you can move to the next slide if you want, because we've um, summarised it there. Um, I think what we're looking for in the assessment phase and in the continuing care ongoing phase when they go home or to another nursing home is looking at um, consistency. Um, and as a ward manager and as a nurse, um, this is quite difficult to achieve, um, especially in NHS um, acute services and in services with high turnover um, due to staffing levels um, and high turnovers of patients. So just as you get to know them, it may be quite difficult to then, just as you're getting the routine set with them, having to then um, look at a different patient group and having to reassess, um, which is why we came up with the concept of having um, person-specific programmes, sensory programmes, and then the controlled sensory room so that we can actually give all of our patients a chance from the admin, minute they're um, admitted. So um, the MDT meet and we do the initial assessments and then we provide the stimuli and while the medical team are doing their reviews and, and the MDT are doing their assessments, the nursing team have got a focus to follow the controlled sensory room to try and identify anything else that happens when relatives are around or um, in the rest of the day when there aren't MDT involvement. So it's quite important to have the nursing team involved. Um, the other thing to do with consistency that um, we are really keen on maintaining is the documentation. So it's the understanding of the, the nursing team and the involvement because the healthcare assistants may not have had any training on um, the brain and on the arousal and the assessment like Dr. Hamrahan was explaining earlier. So it's very important to main, maintain consistency by involving the healthcare assistants and giving them simple, easy to fill in um, monitoring forms where they can say, did they, did they make a facial response? Did they move their, any of their limbs? And, and make things very simple and easy to um, ask staff to document because their understanding of assessment is very difficult to that of a, a specialist SLT, an OT or a, a medical consultant so it's about bringing it down to the level of the the people that are doing the assessments to get the consistency and the monitoring um, the um, part about increasing range of stimuli um, the difficulty that, that we have from a nursing perspective is maintaining the um, equipment because the equipment can sometimes lead itself to different areas and rooms and it's about having someone identified that day to be in charge of what, what equipment's available, maintaining the program in the room, getting relatives to actively be involved and actually asking the relatives if they'd like to bring in personalized things that can help with these themselves because it does help with their grieving process. It makes them feel involved and it also helps them feel like they are actively doing something when they come to visit because we do feel, um, we have feedback from the relatives that they come in and when visiting is eight hours a day, they, um, after 30 minutes of not getting a response from someone, find it very difficult to um, visit and they don't want to leave. 
but they also find it very difficult to know what to do. Um, so actually giving them a program and making them be involved in setting it up and doing these, these assessments. We also have a, an assessment form for families to fill in with simple questions, a bit like we have for the healthcare staff and the nursing so that they feel involved. And it, it comes back to our MDT assessment and it helps when we are giving the diagnosis at the end and it helps with their understanding. Um, further, further training for staff, that is both internal and external. We are still rolling this out because um, within the nursing workforce, we do have a high turnover of staff at times. So it's about getting that consistency and getting some key champions that um, role model it. So in the um, brain injury service, we actually have um, recruited a rehabilitation assistant that is in charge of maintaining that area. Um, and in continuing care, we are trying to get an activities lead who would be um, who's responsible for setting up and maintaining that environment and the stock that we have for it. Um, we also um, have a higher level of volunteers now within our continuing care service. Um, it's quite difficult during the COVID-19 pandemic um, to have the volunteer involvement um, and the relative involvement. But in general, the volunteers, this is something that they find um, rewarding and it's something very simple and easy that they can do to relieve the pressures on the nursing and the MDT and it's very simple for them to help out with. Um, and then in terms of the sensory room development, um, the difficulty we can have is some, some of our patients and residents that have higher clinical needs um, who may need more time in their room where they're on long-term oxygen or they're having some IV antibiotics. It's about maintaining their sensory stimulation but could it be expanded to some bedrooms depending on the need of who is there and it doesn't have to just be in a room so that's where we get the personalized sensory environment from from this going forward so um i think they're the main areas that we have um with our future plans and i think the most important part is involving the families like we said which is our our last slide i think Yes, as, as Laura said, it's really important to involve families in this kind of sensory stimulation process. And that it's kind of the third way in which we use sensory stimulation. So we do these individualized programs, we use the sensory environments, but we also put together personalized care plans at the end of someone's stay in rehabilitation and while they're in a long-term care setting, set out care plans of how they should have stimulation and interaction and leisure activities provided for them. And we want to get families involved in implementing those as much as possible, as Laura said, to give them a role in their, in their relatives' recovery uh, and to give them something to do. We find it really valuable to have families coming into therapy sessions where sensory stimulation is being provided so that they can kind of see how it's being done, how to, and we kind of model the best ways of providing stimulation, which isn't too bombarding or uh, too overstimulating. We also might set up specific training sessions and um, if someone's going to be a primary carer for an individual going forward then we might set up sessions on how to best to interact with them and stimulate them and as i say we put together a uh, kind of guidelines in the time that someone's with us with suggestions of how to grade normal activities and involve the person with brain injury in uh, everyday type tasks such as meal preparation and those kind of things um, what's really valuable with this as well is it allows an opportunity for monitoring over time. And as Laura was saying, it's important to think about consistency over the long term. Um, but sometimes families are the strongest advocates for our, our individuals in terms of noticing changes over time. And if we equip that family member with the tools and the kind of observation skills of to, how to notice significant changes in that person's condition, that can be really important for picking up any possible changes which indicate cognitive recovery or potential cognitive de decline or medical deterioration. So, um, as Laura said, also personalising the stimulation, this is a really important way in which we get families involved. It kind of varies depending on families, whether how much they want to get involved and how on board they get with this. But we've had some really nice examples of families bringing in resources. This picture here is of a personalised sensory cushion that was made by a, a relative for an individual. Um, so it's something that people can really get on board with if they're in that place in their grieving process to actually be providing a kind of uh, creative ideas to add to someone's rehab and their recovery. So yeah, that's, that's everything we wanted to cover today. Obviously a bit of a whistle-stop tour through this quite large concept, um, but we have got time now for some questions which we'll try and share out amongst us and do our best with if anyone has any questions.
Yeah, so if you've got any questions, do submit them via the Q&A button, hopefully somewhere on your screen, maybe along the bottom. Um, so just to start, I think this is a question more generally to the, uh, the whole team. Um, do you have experience of continuing to provide sensory stimulation programmes in the longer term after patients have been discharged from specialist nursing homes? Laura, do you want to take that, maybe? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to um, answer that. Yes, we, we do have quite a lot of examples because um, the brain injury service here, uh, which is just one, one part of the hospital, um, they actually produce a person, personalised um, personalised specific plan. So it's um, a, care, a care plan that's individualised, but it, it's, it's more visual. So it's there for the carers and the relatives to know what to do. And actually in that, we, we, it says... Um, things that I would like, uh, things that I like to do. It talks about the environment that they need, how to set up my environment. And it's very personalized. So from the assessment stage, it then comes over to the longer term care. And we actually have some um, quite, quite nice examples of um, lights that are now fixed in the rooms. They've got the different lava lamps. And then we've got the, the, the mats that you saw in the picture with the, on the wheelchair. So that actually we're trying to encourage the families to create the, the visual and the sensual sensory um, stimulation for the touch so that they can do that in their environments. It, it does also help when um, nursing homes do the assessments um, by knowing what their sensory environment should be like because we have a mixture of shared rooms and single rooms and I think this is quite important in knowing what to do and what kind of um, room you should admit your patients to when you have a nursing home because we have some that are very similar and for a staffing need and patient benefit, it is sometimes quite good to put, pair them into rooms where they're going to have the same environment, they've got the similar things in interest, and then the families like to get support from each other, but it also gives the stimulation to two people um, instead of one each time, so it's, it's quite a nice way to do it. And then there's other people that may need a single room. Um, it, it's also the same when we have um, someone who starts presenting with some noises when they're emerging or as they're changing through their their um, consciousness and um, we may need to look at changing rooms and environments for that reason as well um, because it can interrupt someone else's sensory environment. Can I just add to that as well, Laura, just following on from what you've said, we do also have um, therapy groups that run on our long term care service as well, don't we? Um, the sensory groups, so kind of in line with the RCP guidance of longer term management and how people should be reviewed and, and you know, monitored over time. Um, we have sensory baking groups, sensory art group and things like that that run within our service. Um, so that kind of allows us to kind of be monitoring alongside as well. Great, so the next question's uh, kind of related, uh, following on from Laura's answer. Um, are you able to share an example timetable um, for the sensory room? And also, can you tell us about how long an average uh, patient would spend in a quiet sensory environment? Do they have specific time allocated for more active points in the day, that kind of thing? So I think this um, varies a little bit depending on the patient and where they are in their rehab stay. Um, I would say probably we use the sensory environment uh, more and more as we get more and more familiar with someone. And especially towards the end of their stay where we've completed a lot of the assessments, they would maybe spend more time in that sensory environment and have fewer kind of intensive um, therapy sessions as an individual thing. Um, we don't have a set format, or a set kind of target of how long anyone might spend in that room. It probably depends on how they respond to it and whether we think it's beneficial for them. And um, it also depends on what other things they're doing like the groups or visitors or all those kind of things. But it's, I think it's giving everyone access to it and uh, seeing what's most benefit to have in the mix for them. As Laura said, some people can't spend that long out of their rooms. They need to be at their bedside for various medical reasons. Um, so therefore it's kind of a case by case basis. And in terms of what the day looks like and what the timetable looks like, we've kind of split the day into different sections around different modalities, um, mostly to help the staff on the ward know how best to structure their day and to give them suggestions so that they're not coming up with new ideas all the time. Um, so we've got some like, time in the day where it's uh, things that they have, have to listen to, there's things to look at, um, the time for sensory boxes and interaction with sensory boxes and that kind of thing. And I think we'd be happy to share uh, our kind of schedule with any any uh, sort of 
participants from this talk today who are interested, but I think it's something that you need to kind of set up based on your client group and, and it should change over time as, as the group of patients that you're treating evolves. And when you've got groups of patients, you've maybe got a similar interest in common, then you can maybe adapt what you're doing. Say you've got loads of football fans at once in your unit, you could have a, a you know, football-based activity in an afternoon at a weekend or something like that. So I think it's important to keep it dynamic and flexible and, and meeting the needs of the group that you've got at the time. But we tried to put together a structure and a timetable, mostly so that the, 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 the um, less qualified staff knew kind of where to start. They weren't having to kind of come up with ideas for themselves. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. And am I right in thinking um, the sensory groups, they are running during our sort of semi-lockdown state, aren't they, at the RHN at the moment? Yeah. It's, yeah, um, yeah it, it, it's been difficult due to social distancing at times, but it hasn't really had the impact within um, settings because we know that some people um, benefit more from the visual stimulation. So we, we can get them in small groups where it, it's able to, we're able to distance them. Um, apart safely due to COVID, but we can actually do that um, when they, they, ben they benefit more from the visual stimulation. And we've got people that do better with the touch and the sensory, and we've just had Valentine's Day, so getting the sensory art to be involved with that time, doing finger painting, you know, just putting their fingers in the paint and putting that on a Valentine's card for families or, or things like that. It, it's just about putting um, what's going on in the world back in with the sensory bit that you're doing to take in that emotional um, attachment like Alice was explaining earlier with the theory so we kind of go along with whatever the theme is and what kind of people we have on the ward at the time as to their interest so it, it's quite easy to do it during the COVID time because everyone's got different areas that, that benefits them more than others so you can do that around that the difficulty is within a brain injury service or an acute setting where you don't yet know what they they benefit from and while you're assessing that bit you may find it difficult but I think in the longer term places it's a lot easier to then adapt it. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Lisa asking about um, can you tell us which informal and formal assessments and assessment tools you use? Yes. Is that for documentation do, do we mean? I'm assuming that's what that means in, um, in terms of within. Yes I, I, I guess so. Or just in, like PDOC assessments in general maybe? Be sort of PDOC, Batadoc. Ah, PDOC in general. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, for our groups and things, we, the way that we work it on the ward, if we're doing sessions with patients, we actually just have like a rough um, form that we fill out broken down into the different modalities, don't we, Alice, in terms of like sensory stimulation? So we've kind of made our own form for that. Um, but obviously, these sessions, as we were talking about earlier, are complementary on top of our actual therapy sessions where we would be doing the usual things such as uh, the WIM, CRSR and SMART as well. So we would kind of be able to collate all of that information together, which is really helpful. So that's where our sensory room is really, really useful because it gives us a lot more information that we can pull together when we are summarising things. I didn't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. Hopefully that answers it. All right, we'll move on to another question. Um, do you find it helpful to map the family's observations um, onto, e.g. the CSR, when providing long-term um, reassessment according to the RCP guidelines? Hannah, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'm happy to answer it, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I do think it's very helpful. So I'm very new into the role of a matron in continuing care. Um, I'm like I said, I've been within the brain injury service for a long time and I'm, I wanted to go over and, and have a look and see what's going on, see if I can help. And actually what we found is a lot of the time is the relatives um, ambiguous loss as Dr. Hamraham was explaining earlier. And it's about helping them manage um, their loss, but also making them feel like they are involved and feeling like they're, they're giving and they're, they're helping their loved ones when they visit because they do find it difficult to know what to do. So I think by using the assessments and we have a very simple family observation sheets that they can use to assess when they're doing it with their own environment stuff or in the sensory room um, and it gives them stuff to talk to each other about I, I'm not going to lie and say that the the observations that they see um, are always correct um, 
but that's still something that we can do within um, teaching and explanations and it does help with their understanding of um, diagnosis but it, it helps them guide the way when we are trying to explain um, their diagnosis and how they are so I do find it very helpful but it's something that I'll still be pursuing within the continuing care because it actually is being very beneficial to them um, and actually the, the relatives that I've spoken to over the last six months in my new role is um, saying that when they call up they don't want to know if they've been to the toilet, if their robs are stable and things that nurses like to tell them, they'd like to know what they'd done, if they'd reacted to touch, if they'd looked at anything or followed something around the room. And actually what we're trying to do is get the focus on the feedback on the phone when they're not here to do things like that, rather than talk about the things that nursing normally like to update people on thinking that they need to know. Thank you. Um, actually, we're getting quite a few questions about the sensory timetable. Do you have a template that we might be able to circulate after this webinar? We send yes. Yeah, Alice. Great. Great. Perfect. So everyone, we will send that around to you so you've all got a copy. Um, another question, how does the sensory timetable work with other goals for the patients? Do they all have a sensory programme? Um, so probably not a sense probably depends how you define, everyone has access to sensory stimulation in some form of, of different balance of individual sessions and then time in the controlled sensory environment. And everyone would have, as I say, by the time they leave, we'll have guidelines of what they responded best to and how to set up activities that they might best respond to. Um, how that links in with the goals is, well, for a lot of our clients and, and residents, uh, the goal overall is to understand their level of awareness and how best to interact with them. So the more opportunity they have for stimulation and interaction and assessment and monitoring, the more we're able to answer that question and meet that goal. So I think it links really nicely into goals. And a lot of the time also, as Laura said, we're trying to help the family understand and come to terms with the nature of the impairments that that person has. So by setting them up to provide sensory stimulation, we're also meeting that goal as well. So I think there's a lot of overlap between sensory stimulation and the goals that we're setting for this kind of client group, as much as you can set goals for this client group because they're not necessarily actively engaged in rehab, but it's more disability management. Um, yeah, I think it, it links back and forth, it integrates really well. Thank you. Um, and um, another question, due to the multidisciplinary nature of the team and RHN generally, how do you coordinate how assessments and sensory goals are written up and given, at, given out to the patients? I think this is usually between the OTs and the SLTs putting together a programme. As I say, once you've, we've done the kind of formal and informal PDOC assessments, it would usually be that the OT and the SLT and maybe a wider MDT members would sit down and think about what we have found most beneficial and what the person's responded to most and then put together a programme based on those things and that what is meaningful to that individual. And then in terms of how we share it out, it's kind of, it's very much an MDT job. All, all the different members of the MDT, psychology, music therapy, SLT, OT, physio, nurses and doctors as well would be implementing these kind of sensory programs and individual programs. And it's a bit of a, a, a just an informal sharing out job of how many sessions can you manage to do this week? How many shall we do? And it's just kind of shared out like that. It's not particularly structured and it might vary depending on what other goals that individual has. So for example, if they've got loads of issues around spasticity and the physio is very busy with setting up wheelchairs and bed positioning, then they probably won't have as much time to be doing sensory stimulation, whereas the OTs and the SOTs might be able to prioritize it more. So it completely varies depending on the individual. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, this is a resources question. What are the main resources that you give families regarding brain injuries? And can you signpost to specific organisations or websites? So yeah, I think there's probably a few main uh, things that come up a lot that we recommend. So things like the Headway website, the uh, Brain Injury is, is Big charity website, and the Health Talk Online website have all got really good resources targeted at families to help them understand disorders of consciousness, disability management, and kind of escalation decisions and future care um, for this kind of population. So we often signpost them to that. And I think resources that we give them are probably very variable depending on that individual and what, they, what their main issues are. So we probably gather information from those sources and put together 
that and give them to their families. And I think um, as well as actual resources, in an ideal world, we'd just be spending lots of time with that family by having them in sessions to help kind of model what we're talking about, help them see for themselves what we're saying in terms of someone's abilities or difficulties, illustrating that to them in real life so that hopefully they begin to understand where we're coming from with our assessment findings and our diagnoses. Um, so that's kind of how we en enable and empower families. Brilliant. Well, I'd just like to thank you all. I think we're out of time now. It's two o'clock. Um, did any of you want to say any final last words before we close? Thanks very much for attending. It's been really nice to see the variety of professions that we've had listening today and the different settings that you've been coming from. If anyone would like to discuss any of this more or has any particular cases they want help with, then I think the RHN sees itself as a resource for people nationally when they're treating patients of this type. So please just get in touch. And we'll circulate a copy of these presentation slides afterwards. And this lecture is also being recorded. So do encourage any of your colleagues um, that let them know it will be on the website and they'll be able to access it too very soon. So thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you can join us for another of our courses or lectures soon. Thank you. Thank you.